Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here for our final Fashmash Pioneers of the Year. I'm Rachel Arthur, and I'm playing co-host alongside Rosanna Faulkner, who will be con conducting tonight's interview. I imagine the fact that you've arrived to watch a talk about reducing carbon footprint also means you are well aware of what went down at COP26 last month, or at least you're certainly interested in it. What I'm interested in always with these things is how we go from such talk to true action. And in that sense, it's so great to have a brand in all birds that is doing exactly that. Join us. They are true pioneers in the sense of being leaders that are fronting the charge for a new fashion future. Before I introduce our speaker, however, I wanted to first say thank you to our ongoing sponsor, Clavio, who have been doing amazing work with us this year. Rather than giving you all the lowdown on them in more detail myself, I'd like to invite Pia from the toy team to join us to say a couple of words. Pia, would you like to? Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, and thanks so much, Fashmash, for having us here tonight at another wonderful event, this time with Tim Brown from Allbirds, who I have to say I'm personally super excited to hear from, given that my boss exclusively dresses in Allbirds, regardless of the occasion. Um, as Rachel mentioned, my name is Pia Heilman. I'm joining today from Clavio, a business that, like Fash Bash, also works with a number of UK fashion and luxury brands, as well as a wide array of other verticals within e-commerce. I'm sure a lot of the Clavio community are actually joining us today, so a very warm welcome to you all. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Clavio or less familiar with Clavio, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about us. Um, we are a leading marketing automation platform for e-commerce businesses. Um, simply put, Clavio's platform enables brands to connect with their customers at a deeper level, building sustainable, meaningful, and engaging relationships with their customers via three core channels, email, their website, and SMS, which we recently launched in the UK as well. With Clavio, businesses have the tools and insight to truly take control of the relationships with their customers to build that lasting growth that we all look for. Clavio is the only marketing platform that helps brands grow from day one all the way up until their household name, like in all birds, and is suitable regardless of business size. We don't force brands to choose between either advanced functionality or ease of use. It offers both, which makes it ideal for customers of all sizes to maximize their sales quickly. Right now, we're working with over 265,000 brands across the globe, many of which are actually a part of the Fashmash community. Whether you're running e-commerce on a bespoke platform or your business is set up on a platform like Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, or many others, I'm sure, um, whether you're a large global brand or an entrepreneur chasing a dream, simply put, we can help you grow. So thanks, looking forward to this. Then back to you, Rachel. Amazing, thank you so much, Pia. So on to tonight's talk. We are thrilled to be joined by Tim Brown, co-founder and co-CEO of Allbirds, to talk about reducing fashion's carbon footprint. Tim is a visionary who has been thinking this way long before fellow fashion founders made their own carbon commitments. Allbirds has a label featuring carbon count on its products, and it's aiming to help the industry at large with its open source carbon footprint calculator. Tim, however, was previously a World Cup, Cup soccer player for New Zealand, which is what led him to think about things on a grand scale. For him, it's not about the specific product or sport, it's about the meaning and intention behind it. I can't wait to hear more about exactly that, as well as how it feeds into a highly successful, now public company, and the big challenges we're all facing amid the climate, climate crisis alongside. Tonight's talk is in aid of a restoration in nature project called Sugi. If you haven't already, please consider giving a donation via our Eventbrite page as a thank you to Tim for sharing his expertise with us this evening. All pre proceeds go directly to the charity. Also, please don't forget to use the Q&A box this evening to share any questions you have yourself for our speaker. We will come to those at the end. And do post any of your thoughts on social using the hashtag FashMash. Without further ado then, please welcome Tim and my co-founder, Rosanna. Hello, welcome Tim. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Pia. Tim, I'm so pleased that you are rounding off 2021 for us. Rachel and I were really keen to have 
somebody like you, a co-founder and co-CEO who brings equal parts, passion and purpose to their company. And also I think as Rachel's introduction demonstrated so well, you bring a really unusual background to your role in leadership, which I think is gonna provide such insight for our audience tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks for the kind words too, Rachel. Um, sort of uh, set a very high bar, bar there in terms of uh, all, all, the, all the good things we're gonna achieve in the call, but um, excited to excited to chat with you. Yeah, and, and go through those things more. Um, so I wouldn't normally begin an interview chronologically, but actually I think because of your background as a World Cup soccer player, um, it makes for a really interesting perspective on how you approach things. So I'd just love to know, first of all, how did you first envisage designing a shoe? And what came first for you, the environmental or the aesthetic? Yeah, so it, it, it goes it goes back. So I I, uh, I grew up in New Zealand. I was actually born in born in the UK. Grew up in New Zealand. I uh, went off to America on a design scholarship when I was eighteen, and and uh, I'd, I'd fallen in love with design, creativity. The, the the that was that was what I knew that I was meant to do. Um, but the sport was a huge source of energy for me and I, I was able to take it and combine the, the study and the sport in um in america which was really the foundation of of falling even deep more deeply in love with uh with design at the university of cincinnati and uh and then embarking on what would become a, a decade-long professional sporting career uh that took me to the a-league and um and along the way you know i i think i started to become really curious about um about the footwear space, it was it was sort of a big part of my life. I was sponsored by one of the big brands that I shall not be named, uh, and got lots of free gear and started to ask really sort of simple questions uh, about what things were made of and how they were made. And so it, it all really started as a curiosity uh, project when I was when I was still um, when I was still playing sport. There was no business plan. I certainly didn't have an environmental mission, although the curiosity was starting to ask some of the hard questions about you know where things come from in really simple terms and and then you know in one of my off seasons probably circa 2008 I, I went and visited a footwear factory for the very very first time and sort of had my first exposure to this enormous category so that's it, it I love the way actually that it, it's been very ongoing for you and and that kind of university studying sports combination came together um I think now, and I'm sure entrepreneurs in the audience would be really interested to get your experience on this. We're seeing a lot of companies founded with sustainability goals at their heart, which is admirable. Um, but you've always proven that great product um, that the customer needs or wants is what wins out above everything else. So what for you makes a great product back then when you were starting out and right now? Well, there's, there's two parts to that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I learned in my, in my sporting career, I mean, I, I got to live a boyhood dream of getting paid for kicking a ball around. And, and I realized quickly, as amazing as, as that was, that, you know, I, I kind of found myself at different times sort of asking kind of what's, what's more, what's next, what does this mean? And like anyone, and uh, along the way, I kind of got a taste of playing for my country and saw what that could be and realized that, um, you know, the role of purpose, uh, in going after difficult things can be a real powerful motivator and it can make it make it more meaningful and and quite quite frankly more fun and so that was a kind of a personal reflection and then, and then along the way with shoes it started off truly really with a design insight um, it became a material um, understanding that was an opportunity to make shoes out of different out of different materials and that the rest of the industry had defaulted to using cheap synthetics and leathers and it was an opportunity and in wool, which was a material very close to my heart as a New Zealander. Uh, and, and then, you know, as, as I started to put that together, I found the same challenge. I was all of a sudden making shoes. Now, I didn't grow up dreaming of doing that. I hadn't grown up on a sheep farm. I was kind of asking, what's what's the big why here? What What's the larger, what's the larger purpose of doing all of this, of sinking so much time into trying to uh, go after something that is un more than likely going to be, you know, a, a, a big uh, stinking failure. And then along the way, kind of met Joey, my my co-founder, who was on a similar journey around uh, sustainability, he had a vision that the world was going to need to change, and the way that we made products and services was going to be completely 
um, completely uh, switched around. And so, you know, we came together in 2015, sort of seven years after I started the first, first thinking about this thing and, and founded Allbirds. But to answer your question really directly, you know, I, I, I think it's a big mistake to try and build a sustainable brand. It's a big mistake to try and build sustainable products. You want to build great products. And I think, uh, and, and you want to build great businesses uh, and you want to build profitable businesses. Um, but I, I think increasingly now, you, you can't do that unless sustainability is at the core of, of, of what you're doing. And that if you, if you do that in an innovative way, I think you have a, you know, potentially a significant advantage over legacy competition that are awakening to this understanding sometimes on the back of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of doing things a certain way. And it's very, very hard for them to change. Well, thank you for answering that question so directly, because that's the most useful thing that I think it's a question that so many entrepreneurs face at the moment. And actually hearing your perspective on it, you've, yeah, you've nailed it for them all. You did mention um, that it, building a profitable business. So let's talk about growth. Um, often for entrepreneurs, they find a product that works. And then the tradition and of some might say the pressure is to replicate that, to expand that, to grow that. Um, what would your advice be to those in this position in the audience facing that same pressure from investors and from the board um, in terms of balancing that growth with sustainability goals? Well, I don't think that they need to be in competition. It, 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 it's all about how you set this up, you know, and, and, and I, I think the, the opportunity is, um, you know, is to, is, to see, uh, is to see the two, you know, purpose and profit not not in competition if they are i think it will be difficult and it, you, you you run into choices of course always at the margins it's never going to be easy um, but you know i think at the end of the day you need to kind of make product or service that people want to pay for and i and i think um you know the ability to do that profitably from the beginning that's the core in the really simple terms of what is the beginning of a, of a business and you know i think in our particular case we, um, we were able to really wrap um, the sustainability purpose in, into the innovation of our products. It's, it's sort of embedded in the materials, we invest in them, um, we pay a lot more in, in many cases than comparable synthetics, not always, but sometimes when the costs are coming down. And then we have a vertical business model that allows us to you know, offer greater value for our customers, which was, um, quite unusual in the footwear space that is, is, is dominated a lot by wholesale. So there is, um, you know, I, th I think it's really, really important to, to kind of think about those two things, at, you know, to, together. I think just stepping back though for a second, I, I think um, sometimes you hear a word like sustainability and straight away your mind goes to all the things that you shouldn't do or should do less of. And guilt. Yeah, it's and, and, and there's an element of that that's right. And I think the opportunity here you know, broadly for all of us is to flip that into uh, a word that's synonymous with creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, business, um, and solving problems. Like I think we need to shift our mindset around that. And within that, within that mindset is an extraordinary new sort of space for businesses of every kind. And I think our experience in the last five years is when you build this with a blank sheet of paper from the ground up, you can move very, very quickly. Um, and in the case of even our carbon methodology, our carbon numbering, you can start to sort of, uh, you can start to sort of challenge the competition very directly. But I, I think as a, as a purpose-driven business, you shouldn't shy away from the idea of competition. This isn't a not-for-profit. You're trying to make better products. You're trying to create better levels of service, better storytelling. And of course, you'll always have the advantage of, uh, you know, I believe of, of, of doing things for the right reason. Now, this, this actually all goes into a topic that fa at Fashmash we've been fascinated about for the last year. Um, and Rachel, my co-founder, is a specialist in it, fashion's growth imperative. And this existential crisis that I think we keep we touched on earlier this balance between profit and growth. Um, fashion's expansionist model, it, some might say, means that any sustainability is outpaced by growth. 
Now, I loved your response to the Vogue article um, that came out last year when you released Ready to Wear, your first Ready to Wear collection. The title of the article does, does the world need another T-shirt? And for those who haven't read the article, could you just um, expand a little bit on your take on that on that question uh, that Vogue gave you? Well, it's, it's a foundational question, right? And, and, and it started probably even pre all birds as we imagined, you know, do, does the world need another pair of shoes? I mean, there's something like 20... 20 plus billion pairs of shoes a year made on average. So unless you've got a good answer to that and a multifaceted answer to that, um, that encompasses, you know, uh, purpose and, 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 and the business case and the consumer experience, then you probably shouldn't, shouldn't bother. And what we quite quickly realized was that we were using uh, natural materials uh, in ways in the, the, the footwear industry had ignored because they're hard. And, you know, when you look back and you become a little bit of a student of history as we, we have, you realize that the rise of petroleum derived synthetics is really happened over the last 50 years and they've become ubiquitous. Uh, oftentimes really, really smart people uh, who I admire haven't quite made the connection that uh, polyesters, nylons and synthetic uh, materials that make, that make up the basis of enormous amounts of products that, that we use and consume are derived from oil, the petroleum industry. And uh, we've been innovating with, with those uh, and, and in, in many ways have created extra, extraordinary materials, extraordinary product experiences and nature and natural materials have sort of been left on the sidelines. Yeah. We quickly realized that um, even as we established our supply chain, the wool industry, synthetics have been eating their lunch for 30 years. Uh, that the, you know, some of the natural materials we wanted to use, we really were, 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 were kind of playing catch up and that we had to work even, even harder. So there is, there's lots of um, you know, foundational um, reasons that kind of gave us the belief that what we were doing mattered. And on top of that, we could create in the case of comfort and wool and eucalyptus fiber, a better, better experience for our consumers with our product. And you put those two things together and you go, yep, We've got, a, we've got a reason for being here. And, and so I think, um, you know, being able to ask, answer that is, is really important. And the flip side of it is, at the end of the day, there will continue to be billions of pairs of shoes made. And so the idea of zero consumption, oftentimes I think is a little bit of a red herring. If, if you don't do it, someone else will. And while let's be really clear, we all need to reflect deeply and we can get into this in more detail, on our own carbon footprints, on our own cons consumption. It's naive to think that all of a sudden this problem solved by people stopping buying things. And so inherently the answer is that we've, we have to make the things that we buy with uh, as close to zero impact as possible, if not over time, uh, negative impact, which by definition would imply that the more that we bought something, uh, the better it was for the environment. And so, of course, that's that's very much an abstract theoretical construct at the moment, but I think it, it forces you to sort of get out a little bit and, and sort of say, yeah, okay, this is about incremental improvement. It's about, hey, if there's a pair of shoes and one's got a carbon footprint and one doesn't, well, I'm gonna potentially buy that one if the experiences are equal and the price is, is, is equal. And look, let's compete um, to, to try and lower the carbon footprint of, of every individual product, um, because ultimately that reckoning and that accountability is coming. I think it's just a little bit of a shift in mindset away from kind of singular answers to what is an extraordinarily complex problem. Mm -hmm. And thank you for bringing that, does the world need another t-shirt question back to way before we were all facing sustainability as, as, as consumers. Um, we keep hearing in the media and, and you've, we've both been mentioning it so far in the conversation that there are traditions in the fashion industry that need to be broken. Um, what radical change is going to pivot that? Because I think many of us thought that it might be COVID-19, but actually the last six months and the habits that the industry have reverted to shows that that was not the seismic change that everyone expected. What do you think will cause the radical shift? Oh, you know, it, it, I think that's what I'm trying to, to step everyone away from. I, I don't think there is a radical shift. I actually, I, I take a, I, you know, maybe that's just the entrepreneur in me. I take a lot of positives out of the COVID experience in a bunch of different ways. I mean, I think you've seen however imperfectly a global community working together on a problem that doesn't respect traditional borders. So 
Um, you know, definitely, I think we could sit here and debate about how successfully that's been ex executed, but it's a great warm up for the broader challenge of climate change. Yeah. I think you've seen, if given a chance, nature fighting back and quite quickly, you know, everyone's seen, you know, potentially everyone's seen the documentaries of sort of, you know, coyotes on the Golden Gate Bridge and bald eagles in Central Park, like this will happen. You know, I, I think you can take some positives from it. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I think um, there's no silver bullet here. This, yeah. this is about incremental improvement. It is about um, every single business uh, measuring and understanding their carbon footprint, uh, working to reduce it, uh, and using you know using every every you know aspect of their business and life to think more deeply about it. But it's it's it, this is very very it's very complicated, and I, and I mean that in a positive way versus like we should be uh, dis, uh, disheartened here. I think there's a, an enormous opportunity. Thank you for the optimistic take on it all, because I think um, I was having a talk conversation with Rachel last week about um, climate guilt, and it, it's something that afflicts us all, particularly in this dark month of December. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear some positivity. Yeah, um, I know. Should I, should I get on a plane? What yeah. power should I consume? Precisely. You know, like my family it, in New Zealand. It's, it's, it's really complicated. And I think the, the simple answer is that, you know, this needs to be about measurement and accountability. And I, I mean, I guess just to, as a segue into the, into the carbon footprint, we've started to label every product that we use um, with the carbon footprint um, that encompasses its full production in the same way and, and labeling it in the same way that uh, calories go on food. And all of a sudden, like when we first started doing this a few years ago, I mean, we're five years old, a little bit over five years old as a business. So we've been on a journey like everyone else. It was a moment where you're like, oh, okay, this is moving from the heart, i.e. I'm trying really hard and to, to a, a, a specific number that we can all rally around. And it was, it was a catalyst for a lot of different things for us as a business. Like, first of all, you know, we start to, um, we start to you know, to, to, to bonus our, our leadership to improving and dropping this number down. We got into a partnership with Adidas who were, uh, in the process of trying to work this out. And we imagine like in 12 months, let's not wait. It's amazing to, to make all these proclamations for 2050, but what in the next 12 months, if we worked really, really hard uh, to try and lower this, how low could we go collectively Two brands working together, which traditionally doesn't happen in the footwear space. Yeah, and not cool. no one really publishes these carbon footprints, but on average, they're somewhere around 11, 12 kilograms, maybe a little bit less, depending on the category of, of shoes. We worked with them and made a, a, a performance running shoe that was 2.96 kilograms of carbon, um, about half a hamburger, give or take. And um, and I there was a bunch of things that we could have done better just given a little bit more time. Okay. And, and so you start to realize, oh my gosh, if you just focus on this, if you're accountable, you measure it. Like anything else we've proven through human history, like we can move really, really fast to innovate and solve these things. And so it was a real energizing moment for us. And I, I, we keep touching upon uh, we keep touching upon carbon. It keeps coming back to carbon, this conversation, or as as we say for all birds, everything ladders up to carbon at all birds. Um, we all know the stat. I'm sure everyone in our audience is aware of it. It's often quoted, not always accurately, but fashion contributes two to eight percent of global carbon emissions. The industry must decarbonize, as we have keep touching upon, um, but it is quite a confusing topic. And by the time you throw in phrases like carbon neutral, carbon negative, net zero, uh, you name it, there are a lot of terms going on here. Now, um, you've already touched upon uh, your collaboration with Adidas. I would love to know an over your kind of overall strategy for all birds, um, just to to begin, and so everyone is clear on that. Your overall, I should say, carbon strategy. I'm not in asking yeah. the entire business strategy in 20 minutes. No, totally. And and and, and these are great questions. And and, and I think um, the, even the word like sustainability is so complicated sometimes with competing incentives. You don't know what's up, down, carbon neutral, negative, positive. And so you know, here's my take on it in really simple, simple terms, having kind of worked at this really uh, aggressively over the last five years. Yeah. I think sustainability means 
10 different things to 10 different people. It means um, air quality, land quality. It means biodiversity. It means um, recyclability, end of life. Uh, all, of those, uh, all of those things, and I could go on, all of those things are important. So when you focus on carbon or you, you make carbon the, the North Star of the way you think about this conversation, I, it's not to the uh, detriment of, of, of all those things you need to think about. It's, it's an and, but I think the, the clarification, certainly in the context of, of business around, around carbon was, was really helpful for us. It was measurable and it allowed us to sort of compare and contrast all aspects of our business with other businesses. And in really simple terms, Rosanna, you have a carbon footprint. I have a carbon footprint. The fashion industry has a carbon footprint. Um, and, and England has a carbon footprint. New Zealand has a carbon footprint. All of those ladder up effectively to a global number that we've got to reduce. Um, but to, to, to put the blame of that entirely at the fashion industry uh, is to miss the you know the con connectivity of transport infrastructure of different countries coordinating of global carbon policy of all of these things kind of need to come together and I think once you understand that complexity you realize this is just a numbers game and equally in the short term there's a cost and every yeah. business I believe should be measuring that and then paying a, a tax in the form of offsets and then getting to work to try and understand how they can make the goods and services that they that they produce. Um, as low and as close to zero as, as possible. And I think then it becomes, it becomes really, it becomes clearer, I think, you know, in, in terms of exactly what you, what you need to do and, and how you should act. And we, you're mentioning investment. Um, and, and I know that natural materials, it's again, something that we've been touching upon throughout this conversation rather than these th synthetics. Significant investment is required if, if companies are going to innovate in natural materials. What would your answer be to small businesses who are deferring to those cheaper nylons and polyesters, particularly in the active wear space? Um, what would your answer be to them to I, to I would say it's hard. I would say it's hard and I would yeah. say don't stop trying and I would say the answer is not to offer a, a suboptimal consumer experience because you know it, it, again the assumption with a sustainable product is it's going to um, cost more and perform less well uh, yeah. and, and I, I, I think we need to we need to problem solve around that because otherwise I don't think we advance the conversation you know, I, I think it's really it's really interesting how quickly it can move. But I'll give you one one case study. Mm. Organic foods an interesting one, right? Um, not that long ago, organic food you you know assume had dirt on it and was for rich people, and now you'll find it in a Walmart, and it's become mm. synonymous with better quality and better taste. And I think we need to continue to look for the inflection points or the opportunities in the sustainability space where natural materials, sustainable materials, create better experiences. It can't just be um, requiring um, that the customer is going to uh, pay more. Uh, and of course, there's an element of that. And there's always be an audience of people that, that will prepare to sort of lead this yeah. transformation. Yeah. So I'm not dismissing that. But the broader opportunity, uh, the broader inflection opportunity for the industry is to make better product experiences. Uh, it's it's really really difficult. We run into it all the time, and and that's where I just I mean I just to lay it out for you. You know, traditionally I think when you make a product, you think about three things. You think about what it looks like, the utility of it, what it does, and what it costs. Yeah. And we even we even fused in carbon. It's involved in the, the very beginning of our product and uh, design creation process. It's a fourth fourth sort of uh, pillar of innovation, and it's forcing you. Um, to think about how you create um, a product, knowing that at the very end of it, uh, in the same way that you know calories will will be on the, the, the on, on the okay. product, yeah, you need to consider every aspect of how it's made. What what's it made from is a huge one. Packaging, where it will be made, the location, the transport, um, knowing that there's a cost to that. But at the same time, unless you can get the margins right, unless you can get the look of this right, unless you can get the experience right. It's moot. It's, and, and it's, so I, what I would sort of say, it's a constant game of trade-offs. And sometimes you're prepared to accept and leggings and athletic wear is a classic one, short-term uh, challenge 
with the view that you'll solve that down the line. You, it's just right. a, it's a complicated trade-off of a series of different factors. Um, and I, I don't think that you can allow yourself to sort of say something simply right or wrong. It's I just because I don't think that works and it's over simplistic. This is about incremental improvement mm. and, and, you know, driving towards a long-term sort of plan. And that's sort of how we've thought about it. And in terms of not being oversimplistic about this and how there's this fine balance between it all. You've already mentioned offsetting and how companies should be offsetting as well as reducing. Um, how can businesses, how should businesses be balancing reduction versus offsetting? Well, I, I, think, I, th I think it's both. I mean, I think offsets are a proxy for a carbon tax, right? So pay them. First of all, measure and understand the, the carbon footprint of your business holistically, come up with a true number, and tax yourself yeah. um, effectively, but not before you've begun the process of reducing, innovating. And at the moment, the, the market for offsets is um, relatively new. It's still a, a bunch of work going, going into the methodology. And, and you know, over time, I'm really confident that there'll be rock solid solutions to that, albeit in the short term, a bunch of sort of questions as to how exactly uh, you know, that, that works. But um, what I do know is that if a carbon tax was applied to the world tomorrow, the market for offsets would, would exponentially increase and the cost of offsets would, would be extraordinarily um, expensive. And I think all, many big businesses in a lot of categories, including in the footwear space, they see, they see this future liability and they understand that the real answer here is is innovating and, 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 and creating products that are close to zero. So, but that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the entrepreneurial opportunity is if you can get out in front of it and you can start to innovate and create these products now, then I think you have a significant advantage because it's, it's turning around the metaphorical oil tank. It takes a lot of time. And that's certainly the way that we see it. And sometimes you get paid by the consumer, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're wondering, oh my God, I'm trying to get my business off the ground and I'm worrying about this and all my competitors are not. And that's yeah. the game. That's, that's the opportunity. And I, I think if you just, you, you stay true to, to that and you balance um, things in the short term, I, this is, this is a, let's be really clear. I think this is a transformation, particularly in the fashion industry of the entire category from synthetic plastic derived materials to natural ones and sustainable ones um and i just kind of a generational change so there's all sorts of opportunity and because it's hard is because uh is is because there will be significant winners and losers um you know when, when this all shakes out yeah yeah and you in terms of changing the fashion industry all birds are collaborative in an industry that is notoriously hidden behind closed doors and very private. Um, we've already mentioned how you've been tagging your carbon footprint in the, for, for long term before mass awareness of this. Um, and then, of course, there is your carbon calculator. Um, other industries are much quicker to collaborate than fashion. Um, could you tell us about the ethos of the carbon calculator and how the uptake has been on that? Yeah, so I mean, we had a, a small team that was starting to try and understand the carbon footprints of our products, and you realize it's really complicated. There is competing methodologies, and hey, for a young business that's just trying to get going, how do we work this out? And we kind of we ended up creating our own with an Excel spreadsheet that, um, you know, even going into work with Adidas became the basis of that partnership. It was like, hey, we're, we're just kind of working this out. You never underestimate the power of moving quickly and simply and cutting through the noise to, you know, to, to just move the ball forward. And I think this is where business can be a real force for good, right? You know, I mean, the academic community is get, can get wrapped around the flagpole debating the nuances of, of the finer points of, of, a, of a carbon methodology. An entrepreneur doesn't have time. Yeah. You know? And so you need to be honest, transparent, admit to everyone that you, you might not be exactly accurate, but you're doing it as best as you can and you're moving moving things quickly and that's what we tried to do and then we gave it away for free free the footprint yeah, on your website yeah but i just want to kind of, you know but again i mean i look at it and there's a i think there's a there's, i mean inherent in our carbon numbers is a footprint that's greater than zero and therefore we're not where we need to be but we've got a long way to go and i think 
the, you know, we've got some leadership here at the moment because few, if any, disclose um, within the footwear industry. But this is what the Adidas thing, um, the what was so interesting about it was, oh, how can we spark competition? And it was really brave of them, to be fair, because once you start labeling one product, the inherent question is, why aren't you labeling everything? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then, but let's get after it, uh, realizing that this race is, is one that we're all in, that collective sense of community and of rewriting the rules and of working together. Um, the the, the post-COVID sensibility of whether we like it or not, we're all in, we're all in it together. You know, I think it was an opportunity for us to sort of rewrite the rules. And we've done it a couple of times. I mean, we had a big material innovation early on in our bottom units in sweet foam that was carbon negative in its raw form. Um, and we really wanted to get mass scale. And, and so we made it open source for the entire industry. And we did that not just because we were good guys, but because we knew that with scale would come lower prices. And we actually created... Uh, an agreement with our supplier in Brazil that we would always get the lowest price. So there's now north of hundred companies globally using this material and it's benefited everyone, the world yeah. and also us. So I, I, you know, I, I think you just need to, you need to see this as um, sometimes uh, be less emotional about this and more, uh, and, and more focused on the, the innovation creative potential of, it, of the challenge. And how it can benefit you, even though those might there might be those who think open sourcing that kind of collaboration it wouldn't benefit your business. It actually, in that case, you mentioned just that absolutely has benefited your business. You always got the lowest price, as you mentioned. And even on the consumer level, though, I mean, again, as much as people say that sustainable products are important, and for an increasing audience, particularly a younger audience, that's completely yeah. true. There's a lot of yeah. people that don't care. They want the yeah. best price, the best experience, the fastest car. And so I, I think continuing to anchor yourself in that experience is the unlock that will, that will, you know, will make um, organic food available in Walmart, mm. you know? And, and so I, I just think the risk is you, you get so close to it, you forget at the end of the day, that consumer experience, that product experience is, is, the, is the key. Absolutely. Um, we, as, as, as we all know here, that COP26 has just wrapped up here. Um, and the fashion, in, with the fashion industry raising its overall ambition in terms of pathway to decarbonisation. So with that as a scene setter, do you feel like we can get there in this industry? Oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, if we can put a man on the moon, we can, we can make a T-shirt that has low or negative carbon. We just never thought about it and mm. committed to doing it uh, wholeheartedly. I've seen in five years, um, the shift in, in sort of the broader industry, the financial industry as we've yeah. become a public company. Um, you know, you believe that we can work quickly when we put our mind to it. So I, I, remain, I remain an optimist um, and, and I won't be talked out of that. And I, I, I continue to think that things are accelerating faster than I would have even given it credit for when we started this business two or three years ago. We started making shoes. There's a, an incredible amount of components in shoes. The way that they've been made it hasn't really changed 50 years. We were coming in trying to use natural and sustainable materials yeah. in a lot of componentry that, um, that oftentimes are not seen by the consumer, but we stuck with it. Our factories looked at us like we had five heads or so go ahead and pay four times more for that component that no one's gonna see if you want to do it. And fast forward three or four years, it's completely changed. Yeah. The, 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 the manufacturing infrastructure, supply chain infrastructure are all now coming to us, realizing we're a conduit to take these materials to market faster, better, that the, there's a, the business case is being made not always perfectly, but um, and it's it's just that you can feel uh, even within our supply chain that energy. So I think this this is happening, and it's gonna I think go go fast. And so I, I remain optimistic. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, mm -hmm. but the, I'm sure the people on the call here, with the next great business that will you know put someone else out of business and accelerate this conversation. That's really what what we need. Mm -hmm. I. What, where do you feel, and we are absolutely going to end on a positive note, rest assured, my next question is framed in a very positive tone, um, but where do you feel that this industry is falling down currently? Is it, I, oh, sorry. 
I got excited about that question. I jumped in. My apologies. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to, you go ahead because I was just going to oh. frame it a bit more, but I'd love to know just straight off, where do you think the industry is falling down right now in terms of decarbonisation? I, I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll give a non-scientific answer because I think the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think we've got to we've got to uh, do, do move faster um, to uh, align on methodologies and measurement infrastructure that allows any business to quickly uh, measure their carbon footprint and do all the things we've talked about. Because at the moment that's not the case, and I know there's a lot of people working on that problem. But you should be able to start a business, understand the carbon footprint through all your suppliers, and then make products, and then may the best person win. So yeah. I think there's a there's a piece of work there. I think there's some alignment on. Uh, the methodology that's really, really foundational. And we constantly find ourselves running into challenges there and just, hey, let's just go do this thing. Like we can get 80 or 90% of the way there now. Let's not wait for perfect. Let's not, be, let, let's not let that be the enemy of the good. I also think um, we need maybe a little bit less focus on, on science and a little bit more focus on culture. And I'm not saying the science is not important to be really, really clear. I just don't think anyone needs to watch Inconvenient Truth again to understand there's a problem. No, no one needs to read another UN report. Uh, I think the opportunity is to bring um, the conversation around sustainability closer to culture. Uh, I like to sort of say less Inconvenient Truth and more Tiger King. What is the equivalent of, of, of um, of humor and creativity and connection to culture and sustainability that uh, makes this part of the mainstream uh, conversation uh, versus being still a, a topic that I think scares a lot of people mm -hmm. and makes people feel uh, bad. What is, what is the opportunity for, you know, for um, bringing this into contemporary culture uh, in a way that accelerates this conversation. This is what, you know, the fashion industry, you said two to 8% of the total carbon mm -hmm. footprint. You know, let's, let's not um, understate the role of the construction industry or the transport infrastructure or the electricity grid in the impact of carbon footprints that the fashion industry, you know, relies on. Let, you know, uh, and, and understand that over time, when great changes happen in society, it's the artists, the creators, the poets, the designers that have often making a complicated problem and made it simple and digestible for people. And I think that's what's so exciting about the role of the fashion industry here is we can make sense of this and we can move this thing forward in really entertaining and energizing ways that all of a sudden wins over the, the broader populace and makes makes a complicated idea simple and understandable and quite frankly, better for everyone. That, that's my hope. That's, that, that's my kind of little, like, little uh, plea, I think, for, for the category is that, is that we, you know, we can story tell our way out of this as much as we can innovate. This is extraordinary. You've actually segued into my next question, but I might just ask more specifically because it is a really, it is the way we always conclude our pioneers talks. Um, and we've been doing so for 18 months now. I was going to ask you, what is your hope for the industry? And you've, you've said, or if I could just ask you straight up, what would your hope be for the industry? Maybe summarizing what you mentioned just there. Work together, work faster. And um, and challenge all the rules, the established ways of do, doing things that, that get in the way of that. Perfect, perfectly put. Thank you. I had, I have so many more questions. Perhaps um, the the audience will be covering some of them. I really wanted to ask you about your advocates and how you work with the All Good Collective program. But um, I also know that there are a lot of people wanting to ask you questions too. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who'll be chairing the Q&A portion of this. Everybody do keep your questions coming. I can see them in the Q&A box and I will be back shortly. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you, Rosanna. Um, that was so fascinating, Tim, that last part, particularly about culture. Um, incredibly exciting to think about that opportunity. We do have lots of questions in. If we have time, um, I'll also throw that one in about advocates. I know um, Rosanna was very keen to ask you, um, but let, let's slide through some of these first. Um, Noah is asking, so he says, first of all, he wants to recognise the efforts of All Birds. You're doing a great job. Um, but he's curious if All Birds is aiming to move away from wool, which he calls an inherently unsustainable material. I'm sure you mm -hmm. have that. Um, 
And he says, it seems like Allbirds is doing a lot to explore other materials and similar environmentally sustainable brands are successfully able to produce high quality, scalable products without the use of oil. If you disagree, please correct me. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Uh, th this is obviously a really interesting one. Uh, currently, as things stand, wool, and this is a question from our board, quite, quite literally, so um, has a higher carbon score than, in, um, than some, some synthetics. Uh, in, in many cases. So it's a complicated thing to understand. And I think you have to be careful, Noah, to skate to where the puck is going and not just exactly where things are per, per the conversation we just had. We believe when farmed regeneratively, which is something we're investing in and working with a great deal and have been for a few years with our partner, New Zealand Merino, uh, it has the opportunity to be lower carbon, if not over time, carbon negative, or less than zero, to be, to be clear. It's not there now. Uh, a lot has to happen with the on-farm science, the measurement. At the moment, we say something like wool, and it's a little bit like saying cars. There's a gas-guzzling uh, Ford F-150 truck, and then there's a, uh, an electric car. And those are, those are two very, very different things when it comes to sort of carbon measurement, but at the moment are lumped under the same banner. So you need to truly understand wool. You need to get to on-farm measurement that truly understands sort of cover crops, uh, how, the, how the property is farmed, uh, and if done appropriately, all our measurement and science, and then uh, and science suggests uh, over time, uh, you know, regenerative farming practices can be one of the, the single biggest levers we pull to reduce the impact of climate change. We're not there yet. Um, uh, we've got some work to do, but all our early trials suggest there's a huge opportunity. And if it doesn't, like anyone else, we'll be accountable to that. No, and. Uh, that will show in, in some cases we have some wool apparel products with higher carbon numbers than if we just made a polyester uh, tea. Uh, so, you know, these things are uh, they're complicated and it's, it's about short-term reality versus long-term planning and investment. And we're certainly long-term on the possibilities of, of uh, wool. And one of the other questions, just to jump to that, Rachel, is what are the other factors that you consider? You know, wool is a natural, natural biodegradable fiber that when you put it in the ground, it disappears. Polyester and plastics do not. Now, you could have a lower carbon footprint uh, and a product that um, has all sorts of other challenges for waterways and end of life. And so it's complicated and you have to triangulate around a bunch of things. But at the end of the day, you know, we're going to have to be accountable as we are in our, our 2025 flight plan that you can read about uh, on, on allbirds.com now to uh, cutting out the individual footprints of our, our products in half by 2025. So the message to you is the same that we send to our suppliers, to our suppliers, do the work or otherwise we're going to move elsewhere and use alternative materials. So all the incentives are aligned, the measurements there, the transparency is there and you've got to get to work and just so happens in this particular case, I think there's an opportunity to do something quite different that isn't accounted in the, in the, in the current numbers. Brilliant, thank you very much, Noah. Hopefully that answers your question very well. Yeah. Um, Shedzi asks, what challenges do you face as a small business working with a giant like Adidas? Are there any learnings for others on what to do or what not to do? I think just, uh, just have confidence, you know, I, I, I think, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, big and 70 years old and storied global brand has some advantages and it also has some disadvantages. Uh, young five-year-old, you know, quote unquote startup that's still working it out with a couple of founders that know nothing about the footwear industry. Uh, you, it's, it's a David and Goliath situation, but we have some real inherent opportunities uh, to move faster. Uh, we've imagined all birds with our purpose and our carbon methodology at the center of everything we've done from the beginning. So, you know, like anything else, I think this idea of working together um, allows you to go further. And, and I just sort of suggest, you know, if you're starting something, um, you need to toggle between long-term confidence and your vision, short-term humility, um, but a belief that what you're doing really matters. And so I just, I, I certainly you know, in, in, in the context of, of the early conversations with Eddie, you, you have to back yourself. And, um, and I think, you know, when you do, you can bring about a partnership that I think has really sort of progressed this conversation and done something, done something good, but um, it's, it's, it's never easy getting something off the ground. No, I'm sure. But I can imagine you brought so many learnings 
to them as well you know the the, the other way around by by i think so yeah i think so yeah no i i i believe so and and we learn a lot from them as well so it was a, it was it was it was a good thing and and, and that, that type of partnership i think is a key key part of the, the whole sort of sustainable transformation of the category so I think uh, anyone who's in, in business should be thinking about how, who, and how they could go faster together than they could than they can individually. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we touched a little bit earlier around the view on consumption and you know, do we need another t-shirt? Do we need another shoe? This is a really interesting question in in, in regards to that. It says in light of Cyber Weekend and as we approach the holidays, what's your take on markdowns and the balance with sustainability? You know, again, for the first time ever, we did um, markdowns over over this um, Cyber Monday, and and uh, it was five years in. It, it became a reality as we started to innovate and push and challenge the idea of making new products, uh, and it got bigger. Um, it's it's complicated. It's something we thought about deeply, and something we've obviously have 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 approached very considerately. And I, I just would suggest that. Um, that there isn't a kind of a, a black and white rule on all of these things, you know? Uh, sometimes you want to you try things, you want to innovate, you want to make a product that you believe is, and in, we're working on many things at the moment right now that will really um, accelerate the conversation around low carbon products, but sometimes the consumer isn't ready or it's not going to exactly work. And again, for us to stay in... Uh, build a profitable business over time that can continue to uh, attract new customers and invest in the type of innovation that we think is important. There's going to be trade-offs at the margin. So I just, I just would, I would urge a sort of an open mind on, 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 on these things um, and really focus on the key metrics and the key numbers around carbon and accountability. And uh, over time, I think, that's how we'll win. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to give a general answer because I understand the thrust of the question, but I, I, I think it's, it's a very complicated nuanced thing that we need to kind of work through. Fantastic. Um, okay. One last question has just come in. What were the biggest learnings from your sports career, a pretty unique background that you've applied to business? Uh, oh, that's a good, that's a good one. Well, look, a, a, a few things. Um, we touched on uh, the idea of passion and purpose a lot. Uh, I might suggest that we, we don't confuse the two. I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about Manchester United and I'm passionate about chocolate biscuits. Um, purpose is a different thing. Purpose is a problem worth solving that you're going to commit, if you're lucky enough, in your professional uh, career, uh, a big chunk of that time to, to, to solving and it won't be easy. Um, and and, and I, I think it's one of the, the silver linings of what can be sometimes really difficult challenges in entrepreneurs, the opportunity to kind of make that a part of your job. And, uh, but just don't confuse the two. P passion, passion is, 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 a, is, a click, is a click below purpose. purpose there's no shortage of uh, problems in the world worth solving. And, and, and purpose, I think, is that, that, that's how I would align on that definition. A couple other things, I think, um, uh, the, the sense of team, I, for me, I could never, the entrepreneurship, doing it with a co-founder, I mean, I think the idea of working with people that are different from you, that come from different backgrounds, I and mean, it's the essence of, of team. Um, and I think in my, in my case with Joey, you know, he's an engineer, I'm a designer, he's from America, from New Zealand, the different backgrounds and the ability to kind of uh, work with someone that looks at the world differently is something I would lean into, not away from. Uh, I think the feedback piece is a really interesting one. Um, even in the context of this conversation and, and, and in those questions, I'm taking feedback, which is really helpful. Um, and if you don't listen to feedback as an entrepreneur, maybe as a person, Rachel, I think you're dumb. Um, but if you listen to all of it, uh, you're probably uh, you're probably making um, you know you're probably doing something even more dumb. I think you have to find an inherent ability as an entrepreneur to kind of filter and pass certain things and the number of different experts that we spoke to in the footwear industry and in different categories that told us that our idea was never going to work uh, if we'd listened to all of them we wouldn't have kind of got out of bed you have to kind of be short-term focused on small steps and practicality but a long-term believer in your vision and why you are seeing the world differently and you can't allow yourself uh, to, to sort of uh, listen to all the opinions because otherwise you won't the purity of what you're trying to do and, and what you're trying to create um, 
you know, will be diluted. So, I mean, and I, I draw bows, bows back to, to sport from, 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 from all those experiences, you know, and I, I think the last thing I'd sort of say is, you know, um, that being part of a, a team, a group, a group of people going after something bigger than themselves uh, that matters, it's purposeful, um, if you're fortunate enough to, and, you know, to be able to do that in your professional life, I don't think it gets better than that. Brilliant. Thank you. What a wonderful note to end on some leadership wisdom. Um, I am going to pass us back to Rosanna to close us out just quickly before I do. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. And thank you also to our sponsor, Clavio, to Pia for giving us her introduction. Um, from me, thank you very much and look forward to seeing everybody again in 2022. Tim, thank you. Over to you, Rosanna. Good to see you again, Rachel. Thank you. So quick fire. This is how we always end our talks and our evenings. Um, the first response that comes to your head, you mustn't think it. about it too much. Mm -hmm. That's easy. I, <laughs> you think. A game of soccer in the park or a night out in the city? Oh, can't they, can't they, do those two things have to be different? It's a good point. You could do one first and the other after. Okay. Mm -hmm. Soccer or football? Oh, it's definitely football. High performance or eco credentials? I, again, I would challenge the idea that those two things aren't one and the same. Word of mouth or double page spread in a magazine? Oh, word of mouth is unbeatable, the key to any business. Yeah. San Francisco or London? Wellington, New Zealand. That's oh. where I'm from. That's where I'm from. I know I'm messing with your questions. I don't know <laughs> You're around, going against the rules, but I, yeah, I, uh, there. you're my, from there. Yeah, I'm from there and my, my heart's there and my family's there and New Zealand's just a special place for me. And yeah. um, as great as San Francisco is and as wonderful as London is, that's, that's the spot. You're going to come back to me on this one again, I just know, but reduce <laughs> or offset? Uh, innovate. Ah. Innovate. Yeah, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess with your questions. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's both. But the innovation piece is at the heart of the overlap between the two and um, the push and pulls of both of those things focus on, 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 on solving the problem is the key here. And then taking that one a bit further, reduce or regenerate? I think that's what you're going for, regenerate, right? Absolutely, regenerate, yeah. And then finally, the one we ask everybody, and it will change next year, 2021 or 2031? Ooh, no, I... 2021 it's it's been all sorts of challenges and i you know again there's good things that have come from us come from this and the dust has got to settle a little bit i don't want to say that i'm not like tired in many in many ways like lots lots of people and haven't had good fortune it's easy to, for me to say but there is good things that are going to come from this i promise you there already are i can already see them thank you for that optimistic note and for the wonderful expertise and insight and ideas that you've given us and the audience this evening. Um, thank you once again to our sponsor, Clavio, to Pia, to Rachel, and um, to our audience. I loved your questions. Uh, we will be back in 2022. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Rosanna. Bye. So good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.